Hello and welcome to this talk about bringing claims for judicial review. My name is Declan O'Dempsey, I'm a barrister at Cloisters Chambers and in this talk I'm going to continue discussing the process and talk about the substantive hearing, evidence, language issues, uh, orders and judgments of the court. So when we're talking about the substantive hearing, we're talking about a hearing that's generally held in public, so that means anyone can attend and observe what's going on. The hearing will normally take place before a single judge, unless the court has ordered the case to be heard by what's called a divisional court, and in which case you'll have more than one judge. The court is in charge of its own procedure, in general terms, and it decides how the hearing proceeds. So the general format will be that the claimant, you, will speak first, and you'll set out the arguments in support of your grounds of claim. So importantly, make sure that you have got a clear list of your grounds which is reflected in your skeleton argument and which you can follow as you present your arguments to the court. I'll say a little bit about this in a later talk on skeleton arguments. But for the moment, remember that you speak first and the idea is that you set out clearly the arguments in support of your reasons for claiming that the decision was unlawful in one way or another. Then secondly, the def defendant will speak. And again, they will be setting out the arguments in support of the grounds of defense. After that, if there are any interested parties or interveners, they will speak and they'll offer their arguments in support or contesting or clarifying anything that's been said. And then finally, you have the right to reply to the other party's uh, submissions. Now, remember that that is a right of reply to those submissions. So what you may want to do is to go over their skeleton arguments, first of all, identifying points you might want to reply on. And then when they are speaking, Keep a note of what they're saying and underline in a different colour or with some symbol if you're using a laptop the points that you want to come back to when you're doing your reply. Remember that the court will appreciate if you manage to keep your reply short and to the point. I want to say something about evidence at the full hearings because the procedure in judicial review claims is really unlike a lot of the things that you see on television or read about in the papers that go on in court. The role of evidence in a judicial review claim is very different to its role in other types of claims. Evidence before the Judicial Review Court will nearly always consist of witness statements and written evidence. And generally speaking, the parties are not allowed to give oral evidence or cross-examine witnesses. So don't think that you can establish your case by brilliant questions to the decision maker. Almost always, you won't have that opportunity. However, the court does have power to hear from witnesses. And if you want to call a witness or cross-examine a witness, you're going to need to make an interim application to do that. In a later talk, I will deal with how you go about making an interim application. But for the moment, just be aware that you will need to make an interim application in advance of the full hearing, I would suggest well in advance of it, in order to get permission to cross-examine or to call a witness. 
and like all other interim applications, you should first see whether the other parties to the case will agree to the course of action that you're proposing. So write to them and see if you can get their agreement. If you can't, then you can make an application on your own behalf. If you can, then all the parties can make an application to the court. But ultimately, it's going to be a matter for the court whether or not that application is going to be granted. It's only in very exceptional cases that oral evidence, so that's where the witness goes into the witness box and gives evidence in a live manner as opposed to in writing, it's only in very exceptional cases that that's permitted uh, in a judicial review. And the basis on which a court will grant permission to allow oral evidence is if it's necessary to dispose of the claim fairly and justly. So if you're making an interim application, those are the points that you need to emphasise in your application. How the oral evidence is necessary to dispose of the claim fairly and justly and why it has to be oral evidence, live evidence, as opposed to something that could be set out uh, in writing. I want to say something about the use of the Welsh language in the Administrative Court. The Administrative Court in Wales must allow you to use the Welsh language as the language of the court uh, if that is your wish. So any person addressing the court can exercise their right to speak in Welsh. This only applies to administrative court cases that are being heard in Wales. So if you want to do this, you need to start your claim in the administrative court office in Cardiff or seek transfer of your claim if you've already started it uh, to that office. The court is allowed to hear any person in Welsh without notice of the wish to speak in Welsh, provided that all the parties uh, and the court consent to this. However, of course, if you don't give notice, this may cause some difficulties. So the Administrative Court Guide to Bringing Judicial Review Cases of 2016 recommends that you inform the court as soon as possible, this is probably when you're lodging your claim papers, to allow the court to make practical arrangements. And the upshot is likely to be that simultaneous translation will be ordered by the court. If all the parties agree, a substantive hearing, so that's the hearing on the merits, can be dealt with without having to appear in person before a judge. So a judicial review can be concluded if the judge makes a decision with the consent of the parties to this course by considering simply what's been written in the case papers on their own. However, even if all the parties agree, the judge may consider the papers and then decide to refuse to make a decision on the papers and order that the parties do appear in front of him or her so that the consent of the parties is not an automatic route to a decision being made without an oral hearing. I want to say something about the concept of winning at a substantive hearing. Now, in order to win at the substantive hearing, you've got to be able to show that the defendant has acted unlawfully, either in the sense that they've broken a provision of the law, like a statute or a statutory instrument or the common law, or that they've acted procedurally unfairly. So, for example, uh, they haven't accorded you natural justice, not hearing both sides of the story, for example. Um, making a decision on a case in which they have a personal interest, for another, another example. Or you have to show that the decision was irrational in a special sense, 
You'll hear it phrased in various different ways, but broadly speaking, it means that the decision was one which no reasonable decision maker, having proper regard to the law and the facts, it could have reached. So it has to be that type of unreasonableness and not simply that the decision can be criticised on various grounds. You'll sometimes hear this referred to as Weddensbury unreasonableness and that's because the case where the principle was first formulated was a case about uh, Weddensbury uh, in Birmingham. Even if you do establish that the defendant acted unlawfully in any of those senses, it's important to remember that judicial review is a discretionary matter. The court has a discretion whether to grant a remedy or not. So always bear that in mind when you're considering your requests for remedies. Let me say something about judgments. Very often, a judgment will be given um, then and there, orally. Now, sometimes you'll hear that referred to as an extempore judgment, but it simply means a judgment that is given after a short adjournment or immediately after the parties have finished addressing the judge. And that's one type of way in which the judgment can be given. Now, if the judgment's given to you in that way, you need to make sure that you're concentrating enough to sit down while the judge is speaking and make a note of what the judge is saying. Another way in which you might get a judgment is that the judge will tell you that they're reserving their judgment. And what this means is that you won't get a decision then and there. The judge will go away and think about the judgment that they're going to give. And you'll get the judgment in writing uh, sometime after the hearing. And I want to say a few more words about that. If your judgment has been reserved, you will be told that it will be handed down at a later date. Now this means that there will be a short hearing and at that hearing the judge makes the final copy of the judgment available publicly and endorses it. And this can literally involve the judge handing down a copy of the judgment. The hearing will last no more than five minutes except if there are other applications being made. Now the process of obtaining the reserve judgment uh, is as follows, and of course this is subject to the court making other directions, but the standard way in which it's done is that two working days before the date on which the judgment is to be handed down, the judge provides a copy of the judgment to the legal representatives in the case. Now, this copy is confidential and any breach of that confidentiality will be treated as a contempt of court. Now, if you're representing yourself, you may get a copy uh, of the judgment, but you must observe this rule as well. You'll see that there are clear warnings uh, put on the document uh, in order uh, to avoid anyone breaching this principle of confidentiality. And the idea of sending the judgment to the representatives in advance is simply to make sure that they go over it and correct any typographical errors there might be in it, or errors which are minor errors uh, not affecting the judicial reasoning particularly. Now, during those two days, the parties must attempt to agree the form of uh, the final order that the judge is to make and any consequential orders. Now, the type of thing that the parties will be thinking about 
then will be what's going to happen to the costs in the case. And if either side is looking for permission to appeal, can the parties agree that the judge should grant permission to appeal? Now, their agreement to that may not make that much difference, but that is the sort of thing that the parties should be looking at. There might be other consequential orders depending on the nature of the judgment. For example, the defendant may need to do certain things within a certain period of time as a result of the judge uh, making a broad order within the judgment uh, that certain things should happen. So the parties try to agree the form of the final order based on uh, what is in the judgment and based on what the parties had asked for in their original proceedings. If an agreed order can be reached by the parties, then they have to submit that agreed order, uh, which should include uh, any um, order, the terms of any order, uh, made by the judge uh, in court at any previous uh, hearing, and the terms of any agreed consequential orders. They have to do that by 12 noon, the day before the judgment is to be handed down. If the parties agree a final order, then there's no need for them to attend the hearing at which the judgment's handed down. If they can't agree on the form of the final orders, uh, then the a court decides on the consequential orders after receiving representations from the parties. And either the parties will attend the court for the handing down uh, judgment uh, hearing, and they'll make representations orally. Uh, in that case, uh, the court will then decide on the consequential orders, probably do that at that hearing. If that is what is going to happen, then the parties uh, should inform the court office in good time. So if you intend uh, to go to the court to argue about the consequen consequential orders, then um, inform the court office in good time. And the reason for this is a practical one, that time has to be allocated for the parties to make representations before the judge. To give you an idea of the difference in allocation, if you say you're going to be making representations as an oral hearing, the court office will allocate about 30 minutes uh, for the handing down of judgment and dealing with the consequential orders, rather than the five minutes that's given simply for the judge to hand down uh, the judgment uh, where there are no disputes about uh, consequential orders. So that's the first way in which the parties can deal with this. The second way in which you can deal with this is that you agree with the other side a final order which allows for written representations to be made within a period concerning the consequential orders which uh, the parties would like the court to make. So what happens then is that the court will consider those written representations and in due course make an order uh, which is based upon the written representations only. So that may be another way uh, in which uh, you can deal with these consequential uh, orders. What about the documents themselves? There's an important distinction between the order and the judgments. The administrative court office will send sealed copies of the orders which have been approved by the judge uh, to the parties. So suppose you have gone along to the court with an agreed order. It may well be that the judge will look at that order and decides that it needs modification. So until an order has been approved and sealed, you should not assume, and neither should the other side, that any agreed order that you've put together will be approved. Another important point about these different documents is, is that it is the sealed order that has the legal force. 
And it isn't the judgment. The judgment is the reasons for the sealed order. And it is the order that must be enforced uh, if anybody fails to comply with its terms. So this is why it's important to try and make sure that the order that you're asking the court to make uh, is clear. As for substantive judgments, so these are the reasons of the court, very often these are made public and this is a good source, if you're representing yourself, of uh, cases showing how the courts have decided uh, similar cases. The Bailey website is a freely available source for substantive uh, judicial review uh, judgments and you can put a search string in and uh, you will get probably too many uh, cases uh, dealing uh, with the area that you're concerned with. One good way of trying to get an idea of how the courts are deciding similar points is to rank the results of your search into a reverse date order. So you start with the most recent cases which are on a similar point. So that's a freely available uh, website. But the other point to bear in mind is that the reasons for the decision in your case are likely uh, to be made public uh, in this way. So that if you have any concerns about any issues of privacy in your case, then you need to try and address those with the court and the other parties uh, well in advance of the substantive hearing and the judgments uh, being given. It may be, for example, that you will need to have a hearing uh, which preserves the confidentiality and privacy of your information. Those are points you would need to address early in the process by reference to either an application made in your original grounds or by means of an interim application.